Hey everybody, I'm kind of excited. I'm on the set where they used to film that show live with Chris and Creeps. So it's kind of cool. You probably recognize the iconic couch. Not since the show Friends has there been a couch that's so iconic and the owl that they use. So this is neat. But anyway, let's get started. Really, we're going to talk about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. You see, Mill was pro-freedom and the first classic liberal. He was a member of the British Parliament. He wanted to change morality to make it more focused on freedom in order to get greater happiness. So, he supported complete equality between the sexes, female voting, female ownership of property, female education, keeping alcohol legal, legalizing drugs and abolishing prescriptions for drugs. Treating all according to the rule of law, including those accused of terrorism, abolishing slavery, the vote for non-property owning working classes, not punishing people for freely expressing non-harmful opinions. Uh, for example, he tells the story of a man who had his fence painted with the words, there is no God. And he also thought we shouldn't punish people for living alternative lifestyles. The right to birth control and sex education. Mill was arrested at 17 years old for helping poor people obtain contraception. And the free market as an engine of prosperity. Mill acknowledged that Jimmy John's put AJ's Deli out of business. But while harm is a necessary condition for justified punishment, it's not sufficient, and in the case of the free market, sometimes one company is going to harm another by legitimately putting them out of business because they can more efficiently make better products than their competition. Mill published his essay or book on liberty in 1859. In the book, Mill argues for what is usually called the harm principle. Mill's harm principle. You are only justified in interfering with Sam's behavior only if Sam's behavior is harming someone other than Sam himself or herself. So, for example, if Sam is selling seashells by the seashore, well then you can't interfere with her behavior. But also, if she's drinking too much, but only harming herself, you can't interfere with her behavior. Now, if she's a serial killer and she's murdering people and hiding their bodies by the seashore, well, then you can interfere because she's harming someone other than Sam herself. Right now, a Treasure Coast family is fuming after their teen is arrested for cursing in public. Good evening. I'm Michael Williams. I'm Shannon Kagan for Kelly Dunn tonight. He allegedly swore. I'm sorry to interrupt Shannon Cake, but I have a question. If I swear in public, do I actually harm other people, or do I merely offend them? This is Chris Ice Cream, reporting for VPTV. Turning it back to you, Shannon. Why would Mill give the harm principle? Mill was philosophically a utilitarian. He believed we ought to do what brings about the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But for any society, he thought, the policy that will bring about the greatest happiness just is maximizing human liberty in action and speech so long as the acts and words don't harm others. Mill doesn't spell out what harm is, but Mill does give us two clues. Harm must be distinguished from mere offense. That is to say, I may be offended by something that does not harm me. Secondly, there is no reason to suppose that there is no such thing as non-physical mental harm. Harm can be psychological. Let me throw possibilities at you here that harm would be physical harm, psychological harm, and putting you in clear and present danger. So even being in harm's way is a harm. If I threaten you, you know, with an axe, well, then I've harmed you because if I say, hey, you better watch your back, I'm going to get you one of these days, that's a harm to you because it, it damages you psychologically, I guess, too. 
Surely the old lady who claims to be harmed by seeing two men kissing is wrong. She's offended by that, but it doesn't really hurt her. It's not going to damage her psychologically in a significant enough way to constitute harm. Here's another example. Knowing I listen to music with swear words in it might offend you, but you knowing that about me does not harm you. Do they harm? You're about to consider a few cases. The Nazi professor. Imagine your history professor comes into the room and he announces, As a devout Nazi myself, I will make our unit on World War II something special. Now, as you can see from the cartoon, the students in the class are getting upset. They're probably going to go complain, and they'll probably want him to be ousted. Should he be ousted? Does his attitude harm others or merely offend? Here's another one, the opinionated bank teller. Thanks for the deposit, Mrs. Eldley. Oh, and I'm reminding all my favorite customers to call Congress and ask them to support AOC's Green New Deal. Now, you can tell Mrs. Eldley doesn't like this. It doesn't look like the bank manager is too happy either. But should he be fired? Did he harm anyone or did he merely offend? Now we hit an actual case. Alex Jones' denial of the Sandy Hook shooting. Offensive? Harmful? Neither? The Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting occurred on December 14, 2012 in Newtown, Connecticut. When 20-year-old Adam Lanza shot and killed 26 people, including 20 children between 6 and 7 years old, and 6 adult staff members, Jones lost all of his mainstream social media platforms because he denied that Sandy Hook occurred. I don't know. You don't know that? Well, is that the day? It is. Critics claim he harmed the victims' families because of A, psychological harm, and B, some got harassed by his fans, and a few had to move to unlisted addresses. Supporters believe his speech is at worst offensive, but not harmful. Who is right? The Kirkwood Professor. Jeff Kleinsman posted that he knew who he'd clock with a bat, criticized evangelical Christians for opposing gay rights, and quoted a poem with the line, kill them and bury them deep in the ground. And finally, after writing that violent line, he wrote, it's not pretty and I'm not proud, but seeing what evangelical Christians are doing to this country and its people fills me with rage and a desire to exact revenge. Offensive, harmful, or neither. What would Mill say about these cases? All we know for certain is this. As a utilitarian, Mill wants the happiest society with the least amount of pain and suffering. Mill thinks the way you get that is to allow as much freedom of action and expression through free speech as possible, so long as the speech doesn't harm anyone. So, well, what is the conclusion? And here's something else worth noting. Even though in some cases we are happier in the short run if we suppress free thought and free speech and action, in the long run, Mill thinks, our society will be happier if its people have as much freedom as possible provided that they're not harming others. Why is freedom of speech good? Mill defends free speech and free lifestyle solely on utilitarian grounds. On the next slide, you will see the three key reasons why he thinks we are better off if we don't punish people for free, non-harmful speech acts. Anyway, three reasons for not suppressing non-harmful opinions you disagree with. So why should I not ghost free speech that I disagree with that doesn't harm others? Well, one reason is fallibility. I might be wrong. Maybe I'm the one who's wrong in this case. Another is loss of access to the truth itself. 
If I am wrong, I cannot find out I'm wrong unless I listen to the viewpoint of others. But finally, there's a loss of understanding why you believe what you believe. Even if I'm right, I will believe the true belief only as a prejudice if I don't know the opposing viewpoint. Okay, what are Mill's points here? The loss argument. If the person we punish for a non-harmful speech act is correct and we are wrong, then we lose the benefit of access to the actual truth. Consider the following case with Aunt Betty and Gus, the case in which she is right. If Aunt Betty is correct, Gus's suppression of her idea yields loss of truth. So Aunt Betty says, Maybe we could use nuclear bombs to stop hurricanes. Gus says, OMG, I can't believe you are so effing stupid. Shut up, you P.O.D. By mocking Aunt Betty, Gus, in effect, censors her idea. But if it turns out her opinion is correct, that nukes do stop hurricanes, his censorship of her speech causes us to lose the benefit of eliminating hurricanes. So, no true opinion that does not harm should be censored or punished, because if we censor true opinions, we lose the opportunity to exchange error for truth. Furthermore, Gus also assumes his own infallibility here. Aunt Betty says, maybe we could use nuclear bombs to stop hurricanes. Gus says, oh my god, I can't believe it, you're such a P.O.D. In making this cutting remark, Gus assumes he is infallible, that he cannot be the one who is wrong. But we all make mistakes sometimes, and if he is the one who is wrong, if nukes do stop hurricane damage in a safe way, his assumption of infallibility costs us a solution to hurricane damage. But what if Aunt Betty is wrong? If Aunt Betty is wrong, it is still bad to silence her on the matter. For if we do not listen to the opposing viewpoint, we will only believe our true beliefs as prejudices. In order to really know something, you have to know why it is true. And having the truth get questioned makes us examine why we believe what we believe and not just blindly believe it. So instead of silencing her with cutting remarks, it is better to investigate and try to prove to her that she's wrong. By so doing, you will, by looking at both sides of the argument and the evidence, gain a better understanding of why the truth is true. Here is what Mill says Gus should do in this case. Maybe we could use nuclear bombs to stop hurricanes. Aunt Betty, I suspect you are wrong, but I am fallible, so let's do some research and figure out if you are correct. And, if you do the research, you find out that nuking hurricanes won't work. But the way we know that is that the U.S. government explored the idea of taming them in this way after Katrina. So, our investigation has helped us both understand why this idea won't work, Aunt Betty. And look at what Aunt Betty is saying over there. Oh well, I guess science shows I was wrong on the idea. Thanks for correcting me. And that brings us back to Masterpiece Bakery, that whole issue. Here's Mill's main moral argument, but now you tell me which one is right. Premise 1. No lifestyle or speech should be punished unless that lifestyle or speech harms people other than the ones saying it or doing it. Premise 2. Refusing to bake the cake for the gay couple harms or does not harm them. You pick one. Therefore, the baker should or should not be required to bake the cake for the gay couple.